Hi, Mark. It's quite a lovely introduction. <laughs> um, so, ITV is this huge, huge organisation that has such an impact culturally um, on society at large. So, I'd really like to get your view, and, and you've, you've worked at different organisations from EasyJet to ITV, as to how you build a, a culture of resilience and, and how you meet some of those challenges that Diana articulated so well. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> so, I, I think the first thing is actually building a culture. Um, rather than starting with resilience. I think actually if you have the right culture and if you find yourself working in the right culture, um, everything feels easier. And I, one of the things I say when I'm asked to speak to people who are just starting out or who are in their second jobs, um, you know, the most important thing I think is choosing where you work. Um, so enjoying what you do is important, but actually choosing the company you work for and feeling that you can you get the culture and they get you is actually as important as enjoying what you do because I think you can like your job a lot but if you don't have the right culture you won't thrive because you'll feel suffocated or you'll just feel you can't be yourself or you'll feel you can't speak out or you know all of those things so I think you start with creating a culture where people feel that it's for them that they can speak up, they can speak out without fear, um, you know, they can be open about what they need. Um, you know, I think everyone at work is under some kind of pressure some of the time, uh, and there are pinch points in people's lives, um, whoever they are. So, for example, I know many, many women who um, reach a certain point in their lives where they really, really have to think about whether they want to come back to work. And I've always been, you know, I always say to them, speak out, because not all of you are going to be the same. So if you want to stay, um, you need to make that clear, and you need to speak up about that. But if you haven't got the right culture to say, I'd like a job share, or I'd like to come back on staggered hours, or I'd just like six months to do it this way instead of that way, if you don't feel you can do that because you think people are going to judge you harshly, then the culture is against you. So I think the first thing is the culture. And then I think there's all sorts of ways of building resilience into, um, in, into people's working lives. And I think that is about uh, networks. So, you know, whether that's uh, the women's network, main network, family network, or whatever. I mean, ITV is strong on networks, much stronger than anywhere else I've worked. Um, because then you're sharing stuff, you're sharing experiences and you're sharing similar issues um, and you're talking in a very safe environment about that you know there's resilience workshops I would encourage people to go to those things just to listen you might think oh god that was a load of rubbish but if you don't go at all you won't be able to judge whether it was good or not so kind of being open to kind of listening to how you can build resilience there's all sorts of other ways coaching can make you very resilient you know so I think having an outside person kind of just listening to you and asking you questions, you know, there's a time in many, many people's careers where actually getting a coach is a really important thing and can really help. But you have to then be able to say to your boss, I want coaching for this reason. You have to be able to speak up about that. And with that cultural issue in mind, and, and, and you mentioned how important finding the right culture was to your success, mm -hmm. now you're at the very top of an organisation. Like, how do you build that culture of well-being within ITV? And how, how do you engage with organisations like NAMS and ensure that, as a company, well-being is really on the agenda? Well, I mean, I think it's easier at ITV. I think it's... I could be wrong about this, and you probably know more about this than I do in your environments. But, I mean, I went... I was started at The Guardian, and The Guardian group and went all the way up and it was a very open honest I mean it lived its values very very well um, and I never it was a real meritocracy on you know and then really it was only a group where there were lots and lots of other companies where you know maybe it wasn't quite the same as the Guardian um, then EasyJet was a very dynamic culture but I think you have to really really put well-being to the front because it was so busy and so pacey and so operationally intense that it's actually quite easy 
to not remember that the well-being of your pilots is, you know, it's not just about your pilots, it's also about people supporting the pilots, it's also about the, you know, rostering team who work nights, it's shift workers, it's, so actually everywhere you go is different. I think media, it seems easier to do because it's a very open environment in terms of, you know, a lot of our organisations are writing about it, they're broadcasting about it, they're, you know, we reflect and shape society, don't we, as a broadcaster, so, or as a producer of content. So actually, it's much more um, in your mind all the time. So it should be easier for us, you know, to do well-being and to put it at the kind of centre of what we're trying to do with, with our people. And we have an interesting role, I think. It's a dual role. We have to look after our own people. Um, we have to look after the people that participate in our shows. And we also have to broad, we have to be on screen. Uh, we can do a lot of programs that can actually put well-being at the front. So whether that's physical well-being or mental well-being, we can actually change people's lives because we can, through storylines or through factual, we can actually make people think differently about their lives. So it's, a, it's interesting as a, you know, when you work on this side, it's very different to having worked at Egypt for nearly eight years. It's a different, it, it can be different. And, and with that in mind, with some of your recent creative work with Uncommon, that sort of power of diversity and the importance of diversity to ITV as a brand has been really sort of told through that creative storytelling. I mean, what responsibility do you feel and how important do you see diversity and inclusion as actually a driver of business, not just something that's the right thing to do for society? Okay, well, it won't surprise you to know that. I mean, honestly, I think it's a no-brainer. The business case for diversity is a no-brainer, you know, and I've always thought that. There's loads and loads of evidence of that. And I think, you know, I've been involved in it now for probably 25 years. I worked for Opportunity, I chaired Opportunity Now, which is about gender equality. Uh, I can't even remember how long. I mean, it was a long time ago, you know, it was in the... 2005 or something like that so there's always been a compelling case you know business case for diversity because what you're doing is you're representing you know in your organization your customer base it's the right thing to do anyway but actually it's not difficult to make the business case given the population what i think is much harder is to um to get beyond the statistics right so i think Everyone is now quite focused on their diversity stats, whether it's in you know, gender or disability or aim, whatever it might be. Um, but actually, it's inclusion that I think is one of the biggest issues we face as organisations, which is, you know, you can attract people, but if the culture is not an inclusive culture and if people don't feel it's right for them, um, you lose them. So I think actually our focus now at ITV is inclusion and diversity, and I'm, I chair, I'm chairing a council uh, which is spread right across ITV studios, international, um, the network, and you know our focus is about how does it feel to work here if you're from a diverse background. You know, if, you, if you're a woman in Manchester, does it feel just the same as it would be if you were in Leeds or if you were in Bristol or you were in London, or is it a different experience in London? What you want to try and do, I think, is have consistency. You know, you have to, you, it has to be inclusive wherever you are. You should have the same kind of, you should have the same feel about it. Um, and with that in such a large organisation, and, and with the kind of eye on sort of the, the speed of change in the industry, like, have you got any tips <coughs> of things that you've seen acceler accelerate at the pace of that change so on a tangible level? Because the scale of, of, the, yeah. of the challenge is, is substantial. So I don't know if it's, I, I think it is challenging still, but I do think that um, there's too much business as usual in a way. I know the pace of change is massive and rapid, but I think you can, everyone is busy. And I think until, unless you have champions, um, and unless you have a CEO who gets it and really wants it to happen and is action driven about it, um, and a board, actually it's not just the CEO, it's that top level, um, you don't get the action. So I think people can talk for hours and hours and hours about the merits of it, why it's a great thing to do and why, you know, promotions and succession and, you know, you can talk about that. You can talk about having short lists that always have, you know, a BAME candidate and a, and a, a female candidate. But unless you enforce it 
and you have the will to do it, it will not move very quickly. You know, it will be slow. So I think you just have to have people who are constantly pushing the agenda um, of diversity and inclusion. I, I really think they are slightly separate things, actually. And um, with that action in mind, I mean, one of the most memorable and, and, and most awarded pieces of creative work was the, the work you did with Calm, um, yes. bringing attention to male suicide. I mean, yeah. really, really powerful work and showing the, the kind of partnerships that, that you can do. I mean, how did that come about? Because that's an incredibly groundbreaking campaign. It was amazing, actually. And I, I don't know if I can say this here, but um, a, a good friend of mine, um, her partner, actually, it, 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 that happened. And um, when when it was Dags that actually got that off the ground, Dags is chair of NABS, are you? Yeah. Chair of NABS, and he's also at ITV, um, in the, you know, heads up the commercial team. And it was his idea, uh, and it was a really quite a big idea. And it was about, uh, apparently, 80, well, apparently, factually, 84 men a week commit suicide. So it's a massive and very serious issue. Um, and to bring it to people's uh, real uh, attention, uh, what Dags did is talk to Calm. And we were in the South Bank then. Do you remember the ITV building in the South Bank? It's that big tower. And so they put 84 um, clothed statues, men, on the, the, the tower, on the roof of the tower. You could see it for miles. Um, and it kind of told the story and then uh, this morning covered it, and so it was on all, and then as soon as this morning covered it, it just went viral, uh, and they got an enormous response to that, you know, phone-ins, uh, help, um, people signed a petition, the government actually uh, appointed them as suicide as a result of that campaign, so it was extremely impactful, and it meant a lot of people in ITV, you know, it was like a kind of, it was a weird thing, so everyone started huge numbers of conversations, about what could we do differently and why, what, what, what will we be doing enough on awareness and letting people speak and you know will we so we did that it's part, part of that was um, we started this thing called time to change and it was everyone did a pledge and kind of wrote on cards and stuck up on their kind of walls or their desks or whatever um, what their pledge was going to be for mental health and mental you know, health awareness and that was really powerful. That worked really well. And what was really good about that, what that was, it wasn't imposed by anyone. It wasn't facilitated. It was just something that was quite organic from inside. And I think that can sometimes be the most powerful way of getting um, uh, people to speak about very, very difficult subjects. And that entire conversation surrounding mental health and, and well-being, both within society at large, but particularly within media organisations and with staff and organisations like NAPS. I mean, it's definitely top of the agenda. I mean, you still get the odd, you know, oh, they're all snowflakes because they don't want to sort of... But that's only kids. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not everyone. Yeah. But, I mean, do you think that there has been a, a, a shift? And, yeah. and how have you driven that shift internally within ITV? And I'm thinking of the ecosystem where, you know, contestants and on-screen staff with social media, the, just the rate that people can become famous overnight and, and the volume of positive and negative feedback that they are then subjected to. I mean, how have you kind of changed that internally in terms of how you're, you're dealing with that? Yes, yeah, so I think the biggest single shift has been social media. And it's, it's, it's a great force and it's a very negative force, as you said, so it's both things. And you have to recognise that, but I think sometimes it can, um, it can, it, it kind of come. It, it has been a wave, and I think the last three years has been particularly intense. If you're in it on programmes, um, particularly high-profile programmes, you become the centre of attention. Whether it's for two minutes or ten minutes or two weeks, it it, it can be overwhelming. And so I think we've, you know, one. I think the the, the thing ITV means when it says is that it takes the mental and physical well-being of participants on shows, it's the highest priority. Our own people and, and, and our participants. Secondly, you know, the public have always been on TV. They love being on TV. Since the inception of TV, 
um, the public have wanted to go on. You know, they want to participate in it, they want to go on shows, they want to go on game shows, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just the way that, it's just the way it is. That's a powerful thing. It's a benefit to TV. It's a benefit to people. Um, but I think what has happened is because of social media in particular, um, it has just, it has more, we've had to think very hard about how we evolve our duty of care. So we monitor it, we develop it, we iterate it all the time and I think if you look at Love Island now uh, the duty of care we give it now is very different to what existed three years ago or five years ago when indeed it started um, because actually the, prof the profile of the show has gone like that. I mean Love Island in its first year got, ha had about 400 or 500,000 viewers this year it was 5.6 million so the profile has gone up and with it with the profile has gone a, a, a huge amount of kind of noise around it. So I think it's good that duty of care is scrutinised. I think it's the right thing. I think we should be held to account. Um, and I think we have to keep on top of it and review it on a much, much more regular basis. And of course, it's different for different shows. I and mean, we produce, you know, hours, like 12, 15,000 hours of programmes a year. So we have to make sure that we are... Uh, applying the right duty of care for different programs. So if you're with Bradley Chase on the chase, and not Bradley Chase, Bradley Walsh on the chase, might as well be called Bradley Chase. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, you're, that, that's, you know, it's a kind of quiz show, it's, he's very lovely, he's full of fun. That, the, the duty of care is going to be minimal on that compared to, you know, if you're doing something uh, like Ireland or you're doing I'm a Celebrity or you're doing, you know, all of those, because they are, you know, you're taken away from your normal environment. You're put somewhere far away. Um, you're, you know, you're 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 meeting new people. It's a different. It's very different. So we have to be adaptable about that as well. And being adaptable about duty of care. I mean, how does that also apply to staff at ITV? I mean, what have you done to kind of accelerate well-being? Because no, yeah. No. So what I think what we've found, what I found when I got there is that we were doing lots and lots of things. But it wasn't kind of joined up and it wasn't kind of cogent. It wasn't put together in a way that everyone could access or everyone could uh, know about. Right? So there's things happening that were really good ideas that if you were in London, you might not know about because it was happening somewhere else. So um, what we've tried to do, we're, we're doing, we're going to be launching kind of social purpose um, this autumn. And there'll be quite a big uh, wellbeing program attached to that. Um, and everything we do will come under one umbrella. So wherever you are in the ITV group, you will be able to just go into my, my ITV and you'll be able to see all the things that we do and the things that you want to access will apply to you more than other things. So we're working with Young Mind uh, Minds in this autumn to do a whole series of workshops and activities and um, a campaign, but we do a whole load of other things like resilience workshops. We do there's a helpline. Um, there's just a, we do mental first aid. So if someone wants to do mental first uh, health first aid, they can actually say they want to do that and do that. So there's just a whole series of things we do. One of the things we've done, I think, which really works. So you know, you're saying what actually gets traction is we now have well-being champions in every area of the business. And that is really, really good because they will speak up and they will say, why aren't we doing this? Or Can we, could we be doing more of that? And, and they're, they're not worried because it's their role to speak. And I think that, that works and that helps a lot, actually. And with the sort of changing um, ecosystem and, and you mentioned um, social media and the impact of social media, and um, we've got this fascinating media landscape at the moment where you've got companies like Netflix saying that they compete with with sleep, which is probably not that great for everyone's... Not great if you have <laughs> kids. <laughs> really. You need sleep. Um, but need sleep. And you've talked about being well-watched as yeah. well, which is a, a really interesting I believe that. I just kind of said that in passing. Yeah. And it really caught the mood of people. I couldn't believe the number of people that picked up on that. And, kind of, and I think that's because it's true. You know, I think actually when you say something and it resonates, people kind of go, God. So all I was trying to say is that you know, lots of people talk about being well read, and that's still vitally important, right? But actually, I think it's as important to be well watched because if you aren't well watched, you're kind of missing out in some way. You're missing out on culture, 
or cultural references or kind of what the mood of the country might be or the mood of society might be or you know what is happening you know american stuff coming in can often tell you about societal changes you know i just think there is this thing about don't spoil a show right spoiler alerts you know everyone's really used to that now people are just talking about that as if it's common like it's just a normal thing so i think there is this thing where content has really taken over and that the narrative the storytelling um, is very powerful and there's loads of it so you can watch it anytime any place anywhere and right? how do you watch it i mean are you restrained are you linear or are you no, God, no. I watch, no i have to watch i obviously have to for my job watch quite a lot of content so i do that um, but i also enjoy it um, i really enjoy it but I don't, I, I, I'd be too tired if I'd binge watched. I wouldn't be able to do my job. So I don't do that. I don't really binge watch because I can't, you know, I just can't. And, I, and also, I just think there's a lot of enjoyment about savouring things. And I'm not saying you have to wait a week to, to, to watch your programme, but I think there is something quite nice about being excited. So I'm a celebrity, you know, it was, it was fantastic in the winter coming home, knowing my daughter was going to want to watch it and actually looking forward to the moment of lying down on the sofa and being able to watch it with, with her. Is there something really, really nice? Now, it was stripped, so it was every single night for, as you know, for a period of time. But, you know, it was fantastic. And 10.8 million did that. They all watched it live. And they were all watched us. So I think there's a place for that. And of course there's a place for multi-series box sets and being able to watch three in one go and, you know, having a lazy Sunday afternoon. If anyone manages to do that, you'll do better than I am. But, you know, I think, there's a place for both. But I'd rather my kids didn't binge watch. We're living it all the way. <laughs> um, and so, you, when we started this conversation, you talked about the importance of culture, finding the right culture, and how that's been so key to your success. And there's lots of people in the audience in different stages of, of their career. If you could give them some advice, because it's such a vibrant, and joyful industry to work in. But what advice would you give to people as to things they should watch out for or things that perhaps you wish you had known at that stage in, in your in your career? Um, I would say look, if if you are in the right job, I you like the role, but you don't feel comfortable in your in the culture, when you've just joined a company, you're not going to be able to change that. So give it a bit of time, but if you really, really don't like the culture, leave. Don't prevaricate, you know, because the thing is, you can really only change the culture um, when you've got a bit more senior and you can really make other people join you to change the culture. I mean, one person can't change the culture, but you have to be senior enough to be able to have that kind of influence to change culture. And cultural change takes a long time. I mean, it really does take a long time. So I think there's no point you getting in there and thinking, well, I can do this all myself. I can change this. I mean, you might be able to get a load of people to agree with you, but the, the guarantees of you being able to change that um, are, are fairly low, actually, if you're being realistic. So I think, you know, first I'd say, make sure you find the right thing to do, because that makes you happy. That makes people who work work with you happy. You know, people like working with people who like what they do because you exude good energy and positivity and then you get asked to do more, you get asked to join different groups, you get you know you get involved in a lot more stuff because people like the fact that you like what you do. So that's the first thing. Second thing is find the right culture and don't worry that you're leaving after three months or six months because you think, oh my God, that's going to be bad. It's just people get it. You know, if you go for an interview, people will understand. If you say, look, I just didn't didn't feel that right there, but I, you know, I know why, and I've learned quite a lot from it. So the third thing is learn from everything. Learn from failure, learn from mistakes, learn from other people's success, learn from other people's mistakes. Just keep learning. And I think be enthusiastic about learning in your organization and doing some stuff that's not in your role necessarily, but actually saying, if an opportunity comes along to work on a project, or to work abroad for three months or something like that, take it. Because, you know, there's a stage in your career where that's easier. It's easier to do that before you have any kind of ties or any kind of things that, you know, you, you might not want to be away from home for as much. And I think also set your own, um, set your own boundaries. 
about what you will and won't do and about the balance you want in your life. You know, everyone talks about balance as, it, as if it's only about um, kind of family and work. But it's not. You know, some people want to learn a language and, and do that in their spare time or, or learn to do music and work. You know, but it's, it's important, I think, to know what you want out of life even quite early on. It doesn't mean you're not going to work hard, it doesn't mean you're not going to get opportunity. So I would say always find something you like doing that gives you energy um, and that, that takes you away from work that you like doing, whatever, whatever that is, music, tennis, whatever it is. I mean, I get a lot of energy um, from my friends at home, my local friends, and I, you know, a lot of them are mums that I've got to meet through school, and I love playing tennis with them. It's like one of my things that I kind of can completely detach from my working life and do. It gives me a huge amount of energy. Okay. So I think you have to find, you know, that, that's a tip because as you go through your career, um, you, you, will, you need that. Um, I think it was really interesting what you were saying, particularly kind of looking at some of the research around the percentage of people that are considering leaving the industry within the next two years, particularly in certain groups, like you look at um, mothers in the creative industry, for example. And just that tip about um, knowing when a culture is wrong, leaving the organisation. Because I'm wondering if you think sometimes people, people are leaving the industry rather than leaving the role that they're in and finding something that, that suits them. I mean, what advice would you give to, to men and women, really, sort of, facing that dilemma or maybe not finding the space for, for the tennis or, or, or the friends or whatever it is that gives them the joy. I mean, how do you sort of lean into that challenge and, and, and know when to go, really? What would you say? Well, I just think you know, you everyone kind of knows when they're happy or when they're not, right? You, you know in yourself. Sometimes it may, might take someone close to you to point that out to you or someone, you know, it might be a friend, it might be a partner. but people are your closest people and yourself, you kind of know if you're okay or not, right? And if you don't, it's important that you do. I mean, I think that is one of the most important things is to kind of know your barometer, to, to know when you're doing too much or to know when you're getting too stressed or to know whether there are certain things that make you really unhappy about work. You've got to know that. And if those outweigh the good stuff that you're doing at work, that's the time you have to say to yourself, is this the right thing for me now? Because actually, it just gets worse. You know, unless you talk about it with somebody, unless you say to your boss, you know, I'd really like to talk to you about this because this is really, you know, wearing me out. I wouldn't say those words, but I mean, you know what I mean. You know, this is really worrying me because, and I need a bit more time for myself, and I'm not getting it because I'm working on all these pitches, or I'm doing this, or I'm doing that then if you don't have that conversation, um, nothing will change. If you have that conversation and nothing changes anyway, you've kind of got your answer. So I think sometimes being a bit brave early on is a good thing. And, and I think people really don't sometimes want to take the risk. And I would just say sometimes risk is good. Actually, it's good to take a risk and change is good. And it can be scary. It can be really scary, but it is sometimes liberating. Um, because what's the worst that can happen? Right? You're going to find you'll find another job because you're employable and you've got skills. So being unhappy somewhere is is really bad for you. It's not good for you. Probably not good for the company you work for either. And I'm going to ask you one more question before I hand you over to the audience because I'm sure there will be a lot of people looking for your advice. But I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you're such a, a role model in the industry. Like, who inspires you? When you, were, when you were coming up, who did you look to? Or who did you go to for mentorship or advice? So I was um, really lucky because um, at The Guardian, I had, uh, I had a female boss in sales for a start. And I learned as much not what to do as what not to do from working finance. That can be really valuable. I mean, no, honestly, that can actually be more valuable than anything else. So that's not a negative comment. That's actually, she was very inspiring. Um, and I also had, you won't know, because you're all too young, I think you're all too young, 
there's this amazing woman called Helen Alexander, who was chief executive of The Economist, who was older than me, probably by you know, a few years, and Gail Reebok, who was at Random House. And they were both amazing to me, because I was much more junior. But uh, whenever I saw them, they'd just be really lovely, and they'd ask how I was getting on. And then Gail actually took me out for lunch, and I was a sales exec. So I mean, you know, that was really amazing. And I found it very easy to chat to her, and she was always saying to me, you've got to work less hard. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, you work too hard, you work too hard, you need to get some balance in your life. I was like, at that point, balance meant something completely different to me. It meant work and parties. Yeah. That was my balance, right? It, wasn't, it really wasn't about getting home. It really wasn't about getting home. Whereas since I've had kids, you know, balance for me is I set very clear boundaries for myself. I say, you know, I'm going to get home. The nights I get home, I'm getting home. And, you know, unless it's a crisis, I don't let it get in the way. If I say to my kids, I'm, I'm going to be home, I'm going to be home. And the days I'm traveling, they know I'm traveling. They know what's going on. I'll FaceTime them or I'll call them or whatever. But I, I separate. that's my balance now is to make sure I've got the right family time and the right work time. So it's all different. It's all relative, isn't it? Well, Gail, was, it was interesting. She was always pushing me to think about balance. Um, so those two women, I would say, Helen and, yeah, again, yeah, Helen has sadly died. And, um, and anyway, so very inspiring women. And did it the right way, solid values, great moral compass, um, you know, really made their way in the world just by being themselves, not by kind of trying to change themselves. And that, that they, they were great role models. Brilliant. I mean, does anybody have any questions about any questions? I think we've got a roaming, a, a roaming, a roving mic. A roaming mic. Somewhere. Am I over? Just here. Sorry, I'm making you come with me. Okay, serious pressure being the first question. <laughs> um, so I'm at that sort of time of my life where I'm in my early 30s, what, like 10 years behind me working in advertising, um, and a lot of my peers also are in the same position. So this is a question for all of us. Um, if you feel that you've done all of the suggested steps, you've been enthusiastic, you've been positive, you've done your work, you've over-delivered, you're in a company that generally the culture's pretty good, doesn't always align, but it works, and you're still not taking that next step, just as you're at that point where you're like, oh, I'm gonna do the kids thing or not, I don't know. Um, <laughs> no pressure. Um, I'm just curious if you have any, because it's kind of at that point for me specifically where I'm like, do I hang around and continue working to get to a place where I feel more comfortable before I sort of stop and have stop and do the children thing and I know you don't need to do a massive I'm taking all the air time sorry um do you have anything sort of specific to advise people that are not getting where they want to be but also sort of have to decide fairly imminently what they should do yeah look I would say there's you might decide to have a child tomorrow it could take you six months or it could take you five years. You just don't know. And I'm talking from experience. So I would suggest that you don't, that having a child is a brilliant thing if you want to have one, but it will, you, you can't dictate when that's going to happen. You can plan it, but you can't know for sure when that's going to happen. So, so make that plan, whatever is right for you, for whenever that is right. I, I can't help you on that one. That's okay, I wasn't asking that. <laughs> then I would say, make a decision about your career regardless of getting pregnant. Because your role, your career, is should be able to be manageable whether you have children or not. Now, there's a very big difference um, between setting up your own company and getting pregnant within six months of each other. And I remember advising someone who's now incredibly serious, uh, se she's serious, but she's also very senior in the industry. And she came to me and said, um, I want to start this business with another very senior person, and, um, but I, I'm also, I think I'm pregnant. And I said, well, it's up to you, but honestly, 
you're very well regarded where you are, and I'm not sure this would be the right time because it's going to be horrible. Because startups are horrible, right? You have to spend 24 seven, you know, you might get into debt, you might go bankrupt. I mean, all sorts of things can happen. I mean, that's, that's probably not the time to take the risk, right? Because she was pregnant. And she did move and she's done really, really well. Now, she might regret never starting up, but she doesn't actually regret having her kids and having a great career at the same time. So what I'm saying to you is, that's not the same as kind of moving jobs in an area you know, you've got 10 years experience, and if you're not getting away, I don't even know where you work, and if you work for someone I know really well, that would be awful. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying gen generically is, if you are frustrated and you're not getting on, you've had all the right conversations, then make a change. Because regardless of getting pregnant or not, you know what you're doing in work, right? So what's the risk? It may not work out, then you'll move again. You see what you mean? As long as you get your maternity leave a bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> as long as you can roll out of pocket. <laughs> but yeah, as long as you've got that bit right, you should. Don't be frustrated. Don't, don't, you know, I think one of the things is you only have one life. It's a terrible cliche, but you only have one life. It goes so fast. And if you're not making the most of the job you're in, and you're not really doing what you want to do, make the change. <laughs> Great advice and, and really question. brilliant question. <laughs> Very good question. And um, we've got another question just down here. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who is on a four day week because I've had I've come back from maternity leave? And it's the feeling of guilt of when you are leaving a team behind as well. They're having to pick up a lot of your workload. So if you have an extra day's holiday, then they're picking up even more. Um, but it's not just a feeling of guilt from a team point of view, but a feeling of guilt of also leaving a child who's quite young. So I think guilt is a very normal emotion especially when you've just had a baby, or if you've got young children. Um, but it's, it's a really negative kind of emotion because it doesn't get you anywhere. It just makes you feel really bad, doesn't it? I mean, it's like just you feel crap. So I think one of the things you need to think about both ways is, you know, um, how you make yourself, so you're, you're, you know, you, you've chosen to work, so how do you, make yourself feel that that's the right decision, leaving your child. Um, and, you know, talk to other working mothers, everyone feels a bit of guilt, but actually the ones that are happiest are the ones that have made peace with themselves. And actually as your child gets bigger, as long as you're happy at work, you know, they'll say, thank God you work. I mean, genu genuinely, you know, they will, they will not begrudge you working um, as long as you're happy. Right? Because there's nothing worse than you not being happy at work and then coming home and being grumpy and you know blah blah blah. So that, you know the, the guilt thing you have to square I think with yourself with your family. I think at work it's a kind of a more serious issue in some ways because I think you're not set up the company. It's not set up to actually do four days a week. So we we've done lots and lots of four day a week. Um, uh, Usually when women, are, usually women, not always, sometimes men. Um, but you have to structure that. Your boss has got to help you because you shouldn't feel you're leaving loads of work for other people. There should be a way of that working where you can leave and say, I've done my job because I'm, being, I'm doing four days a week and I'm paid for four days a week. And that's the way they've structured it. So you shouldn't, you need to, I think, talk to whoever manages the team to say, you might be managing the team, but you've got to just put in place the structure where someone's covering for you, but it's it's legitimate work for them to cover for you, not just doing you a favour. They're not doing you a favour covering for you. It's work. So someone's got to, someone at a more senior level has got to make sure that that is totally understood by the team. Seriously. Because otherwise, 
you know, anyone, because you're, you're kind of, just remember when, when you're going in on a part-time, like four-day week or three-day week or a job share, any of those things, you're kind of role modeling for others. Mm -hmm. like, there is a huge amount of pressure on that as well. I'm also the first person of my level to ever go back on four days, so, right. it, you know, you have, I have that at the back of my mind all of the time to make sure that for future yeah. women and men who want to work part-time, there is a huge amount of responsibility to make sure that I'm there is success. But, but the way to do that is to make sure that the company, your boss, the company understands that four days a week is a brilliant way of keeping women in the workforce. It is brilliant. And actually, you probably work much more than four days a week, um, right? So the company is benefiting massively. And I can't tell you not to because you probably just will. But the fact that they have to make it okay for the whole team. The whole team's got to feel okay. It's up here. Yeah, well, you've got to sort that out. So, <laughs> there you are. You talk to yourself and say, stop it. I think it really matters with handbag. You can put your guilt in there. <laughs> it's right. it's just, you know, the guilt thing, you know, it's a, it's, you've just got to remember how negative an emotion guilt is. Because, what, you know, it doesn't make anybody, it just doesn't make you feel good. That's such a good question and so applicable to so many people. So thank you very much for asking that. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. There's one just up. Um, I don't think you need to run. I think we can pass it back. Thank you. This is mental because I'm, I'm five months pregnant at the moment and these two people, I'm right bang in the middle. That would have been a question I would have very easily asked not long ago and you're my future. So, <laughs> so it's kind of my, my question keeps changing minute by minute. Um, I, so yeah, I'm five months pregnant. Um, I love my job, I love my career, but equally incredibly excited to be a mum. The company I work for, I love my job, I love them, but I am the first, I'm kind of the test subject, I think they've never had to go through the process of having a, a, a pregnant woman maternity leave and, and all that kind of thing. I'm fairly senior in the company. How would you suggest, I mean, how do you, do you think it's something that we should be almost taking into our own hands in terms of helping to build and create that culture yeah. rather than waiting on Mr. CEO to well, just take wait, the steps? God, don't wait. Right. So, <laughs> I don't wait because you're in this brilliant position to be able to set the, the, the framework for anyone else that comes after you. Um, and, you know, I got some brilliant advice from when I was at The Guardian. I was pregnant. I was CEO of The Guardian when I got pregnant. Everyone was deeply shocked because everyone thought I couldn't get pregnant at that point. I don't know how everyone knew that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, but but um, the deputy editor of The Guardian was an amazing woman called Georgina Henry. And she came in to see me. She was delighted for me. And she came in and she said, you have got to take maternity leave. So I said, yes, yes. She said, no, I mean it. I mean it. You've got to actually, even though you might be working at home, you have got to not come in. Right, she said, because how you do it, every single person is watching you do this, everyone. And you have got to do some things that set the tone for other women. So that was such good advice. You know, it was brilliant. And actually, I did actually uh, take maternity, proper maternity leave. I did work from home a lot. People would come and see me and stuff like that. But on my terms, for, for that period, the company didn't fall apart. I left it in very good shape. Everyone knew what their responsibilities were um, when I wasn't going to be there. And it, and what I needed to be contacted for, if it was certain things, it was a very short list of things that you know I would get involved in. Um, and it worked really, really well. And it did change the number of women at The Guardian that came up to me and said, oh my God, that was fantastic. It just gave me permission to do it that way. And so I think that's what your opportunity is. It's brilliant. Don't be worried about it because you, you clearly love what you do. They clearly value you. You have the opportunity of doing it and setting the scene for others to come. So I wouldn't let anybody else do that for you. Just set it, set it up the way you think it's best for, for you and for the organisation you work for. 
Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good, good luck. A lovely point to end on. I mean, congratulations and yeah. good luck. And we thank you so much for such an open question. conversation. Um, it's been really, really um, eye-opening. And thank you so much for the questions. All three questions were so, um, so open and brilliant. So we really appreciate that. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.